Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Stefan Bergmans. I'm the Director for Research and Innovation uh, at the European University Association. So welcome. Welcome to this uh, webinar series on the universities and the future of scholarly publishing. Uh, I am talking about a webinar series because uh, this is actually the fourth and last one in a series. We started four weeks ago to look into the unknown uh, and the most likely future for open access uh, publishing. Then three weeks ago, uh, we looked at universities and the promises of scholarly uh, publishing. Just last week, I was fortunate enough to moderate a great panel on transformative agreements. Just so that you're aware, if you missed any of those webinars, all the recordings are available on the EUA uh, YouTube channels. It's going to be the case also for today when we're going to get practical. Today, we're looking at uh, aligning institutional policies with Plan S. This is a members only, so EUA members only uh, webinar. And that is because we wanted to uh, give the chance to our members to interact directly uh, with the representative from the European Commission for Plan S, but also our two guests uh, from the library world. Uh, again, it will be made completely open because the webinar afterwards, the recording, will also be available on the EUA uh, YouTube channel. So let me start. So open and transparent practices does accelerate research process at really a, a, an amazing speed. And I think the pandemic has shown us that quite clearly. But also they reinforce the core academic values such as research integrity, uh, cooperation uh, and knowledge sharing, for example. So EUA has really, in this area, become became a leading voice in the debate on open access. And we've been active uh, and actively engaged, actually, in this area since uh, 2007. Uh, in July uh, 2020, EUA actually launched its strategic plan. So uh, it had four priorities and the association's work on open access in scholarly publishing serves those specific priorities. More specifically, uh, EUA uh, on the effective advocacy, we advocate for full and immediate open access to ambitious open access policies at different levels. We also support universities and authors in retaining their rights and being able to openly share their research outputs without restrictions. And finally, EUA works to achieve more transparency and greater sustainability in the scholarly publishing system together with its members. Uh, this is just to show you actually on, on, on the left, in March 2008 is when we published the very first publication from EUA on open access. And these were recommendations from the EUA Working Group on Open Access for the university leaders, for the National Rectors Conferences, and for EUA also. On the right, what you're seeing is back from May of this year, the latest actually publication from EUA. It was a joint uh, statement uh, with CESAR and Science Europe, where we were calling on all publishers to fully respect research, researchers' rights and to end the use of restrictions and embargoes. Uh, a major other strand of work based on our uh, uh, strategic priorities is monitoring the implementation of open access policies in European universities. So, here, what you're seeing is a series of reports. Since 2014, we have more than 700 universities that have cumulatively responded to the different ways of EUA open access surveys first, but now open science surveys. So EUA monitors and is very active uh, and engaged with the national and the European developments impacting the transition towards open, uh, open access. So since 2017, EUA has also assembled very comprehensive data on big deals between, uh, so these are the big deals between the scholarly uh, publishers and national consortia made up of libraries, universities, and, and research organization. And really this is to monitor the evolution of negotiations mechanism between universities and publishers. So very naturally, uh, finally in uh, July, 2020, uh, we published also the read and publish study, the last report you, you see here. As we all know, 
uh, a successful transition to open science requires a cultural change, but also it needs systemic and technical reforms. So this requires a very concerted uh, effort from all key stakeholders. So, and we uh, support with this uh, European universities really to improve researchers' engagement in, in open access, but also to highlight the importance of implementing monitoring mechanisms of open access. Solidarity is also a fundamental value at EUA, and that's why we believe it is important to build capacity and support European universities do the best they can and be the best that they can be. Uh, but this needs to be very inclusive. So we want to make sure that uh, we don't leave anyone behind. And that's why we have, for example, at EUA, uh, the platform for uh, negotiating uh, consortia. Uh, let's now go to the very new data uh, that EUA has not yet published, because on the 8th of July, we will release the results of the latest survey on open science. So I'm very happy, very glad. Now I'm going to actually share with you uh, in exclusivity uh, some of these uh, results. For example, this figure that you see now represents the uh, distribution of responses for both the importance uh, level and the implementation level uh, for some selected open science elements. So open access to research publication comes first, both for strategic importance and level of implementation. So we're talking here about 90% of respondents of these responding institutions assign a high or very high level of importance and over 60% assign a high or very high level of implementation to this area. This is in comparison, for example, to RDM or FAIR data that you see here, which are actually high level of importance, but lower level of implementation or worse, for example, when you look at uh, citizen science or open evaluation that have a low level of importance, but also, of course, a low level of implementation. Here in this next figure, what you see is that 54% of the surveyed institution have an open science policy in place. So we investigated specifically uh, those uh, open access elements that are included in this policy. And what you're seeing is that here on top, this depositing research article in a repository was the most frequent action mandated or encouraged in open science policies with almost 100% of cases. There's also publishing articles in open access journals here um, at the bottom uh, was primarily used as an encouragement element with 75% of institution. And back to the top in second position, you have provisions on copyright and uh, IP rights uh, which are included in institutional policies for almost 80% of universities. I don't have the time to go into all the rest, but you'll have all the results in the report and we, again, will be publishing uh, very, very shortly. But what I can tell you also from the, those results uh, is that uh, approximately 80% of the surveyed institution have a dedicated website on open access. That's what you see here on the top, but also provide training programs still here in second position. In addition, over half of the surveyed institutions support researchers in developing uh, an open access research strategy. They also provide funding for open access publishing or have established dedicated services to researchers. Now, let me move to the next slide. And going back now to the previous EUA open access survey, we saw that most institutions consider that researchers main concern about self-archiving publication uh, in a repository where first about publishers copyright infringement, and that was about 52%. That's what followed by the lack of administrative support at over 40%. And next, uh, where concerns over the quality of open access publications and limited awareness of open access. So why am I showing you this? Well, because it is actually data that dates back from uh, the EUA survey from 2017 to 2018, as you can see here at the bottom. But now, of course, Plan S has been in action uh, since January 2021. And Plan S is a crucial piece for the uh, transition to open access by the stakeholders uh, in the uh, academic uh, community. And uh, EUA uh, is one of the first supporters of Plan S and provided constructive input on the plan itself, 
uh, and uh, its condition. You can see here three publications. Uh, the two first are back from uh, 2000, uh, uh, sorry, the first one is from 2018, and the two next one actually were uh, back from 2019. And uh, going back now to our survey to be published soon, uh, the results show that a significant majority of institutions, we're talking here 68%, uh, in countries where the main research funders have adopted Plan S, are indeed preparing for its implementation. And only 17% or not. So that's the figure on, on the left. What you see now on the right is actually, on the other hand, in countries whose main research funders have not yet adopted Plan S, only 24% of institutions are preparing for its implementation, whereas 51% are not. Uh, and just to give you uh, examples, because of the two speakers we have, one from Ireland, one from Slovenia, um, in those countries, both actually uh, are where the, these two countries are where uh, main funders here uh, have adopted Plan S. And so they are in the case, and we're going to ask those, uh, those participants, those uh, panelists, if it is the case in their country. So it is also important uh, in the you know in light of uh, who's coming to speak to you today to remember that uh, uh, the uh, horizon that Horizon Europe grantees will also have to comply with Plan S, and we have some of uh, someone of course from the European Commission to come in and tell us about that. So I'll stop here for now. I'll thank you for your uh, attention. We will take questions later because we've got a great panel. Uh, we have Johan Roeg who is actually coming, speaking and representing Coalition S. We have uh, Alea Lopez de San Roman, who will be representing uh, DG Research, European Commission. She is from the uh, Open Science Unit. We will then, after the presentation, also hear about, uh, 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 hear from Hardy Schwan from the National University of Ireland, Galway. And uh, finally, Mocha Kotar, who is from the University of Ljubljana, and both of them will give us the perspective from the uh, li uh, library. So uh, next, I'd like now to uh, invite Johan to uh, join us. Johan Rurek is the executive director of Coalition S, a group of over 20 national research funding organizations, supported by the European Commission also. Uh, and um, Coalition S puts, uh, is the one who put, of course, forward Plan S. Uh, and their aim is to make full and immediate open access to research publication a reality. Johan is also a linguistics professor at Leiden University and editor-in-chief of the FAIR open access journal, Glossa. Johan, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for inviting me, Stefan. So I, I will be talking about uh, the Plan S Rights Retention Strategy in, in this context. Um, uh, first about the principle that's behind the rights retention uh, strategy, perhaps. So a rights retention strategy is based on a very simple principle, namely that the peer-reviewed author accepted manuscript, the AAM, is the intellectual creation of the author and belongs to them. That's, that's the idea. Uh, we believe that delivering publication services does not entitle publisher to ownership of that AAM. Um, uh, publication services, of course, should be paid for, but not with ownership of the AAM. We believe that that is really a very old-fashioned concept that publishers should own uh, should own uh, uh, the uh, the publication uh, in and of itself uh, without uh, share without giving the author uh, ownership uh, uh, of it. Uh, this is also important, I think, as a matter of uh, intellectual ownership rights and assets of universities. Funders and universities should make sure that researchers are not deprived of essential in intellectual ownership rights. We've also seen in uh, uh, the case of SciHub, for instance, how important publishers uh, believe that um, uh, ownership of publications is and uh, what they are worth. And they are, if they are worth that much to the publishers, they're certainly worth as much to the institutions and the, the authors, we believe. Um, now, what are the objectives of the rights retention strategy? Well, as you know, uh, Coalition S organizations uh, want to have all the research they fund uh, published uh, open access with zero embargo and with a CC by license. That's sort of our minimum minimum goal. Uh, this allows our authors to seek publications in a wide variety of journals, especially journals that have no open access options and then are still subscription journals. 
uh, and we also want by uh, uh, by this strategy encourage the development of transformative arrangements by which uh, publishers can properly ask for the payment of, of publication services. We see no problem uh, with that, paying for these uh, services. Uh, the idea really is to empower all researchers working under a coalition as mandate to retain sufficient rights to their own author accepted manuscript. Not only researchers working under a coalition as a mandate, I might add, but in fact, all researchers, because of course, the rights retention strategy is not restricted to a coalition as funded researchers, but it in fact extends to all researchers, as I will show in a minute. Um, we also want, uh, one of the other objectives of the rights retention strategy is to make things simpler, namely cut through the current complexity of journal permissions. As you know, journal permissions are different from publisher to publisher. Some publishers allow you to publish on your website, but not in a repository. Some allow in a repository, but not on your website. Uh, when authors own the AEM and share it in a repository on publication, all that complexity is, is gone. There are no embargoes on the AEM, and the publishers can own the VOR. We don't see a problem with, all, with the publishers owning the version of record of the, of the publication. I'll come back to that as well. Uh, so, the, what's the problem that we seek to resolve? Well, as you know, uh, the grant agreements of coalition as organizations now have, have as this minimum requirement that at least the AAM should be in a repository with zero, zero embargo and with a CC BY license. Uh, this is for, this is the very minimum for some funders. It's it's broader. The version of record should also be in a in a repository. But at the very this is our minimum requirement. Um, at the same time, we know that many researchers, of course, sign a publishing agreement, and that publishing agreement signs away their rights to deposit the AAM in a repository with zero embargo and with a CC BY license, because there is a copyright transfer agreement that re uh, regulates this. And so there is a contradiction between the researcher's grant agreement on the one hand, which requires that the author publish uh, a deposit a copy uh, in a repository on the one hand and the publishing agreement with the publisher on the other which forbids the researcher to do that um, and the rights retention strategy is in fact designed to resolve that contradiction the fact that an author assigns a cc by license to their uh, to their aam uh, takes legal precedence over any later copyright transfer agreement over or specifically over the provisions that would be in contradiction in that later copyright agreement and basically overwrites that copyright agreement. And that is because the CC BY is inherent in the publication uh, once you assert the, your right on that. It cannot be lifted by any later agreement. So the rights retention strategy really is a very strong way for authors to assert their rights on uh, the publication. Now, of course, publishers have a right to refuse uh, such uh, claims, and they, they might be uh, uh, willing to re uh, re uh, refuse uh, authors to uh, uh, publish in, the, in, in their journal of choice, but that is, that is their choice. Until now, we have only one case of a publisher that has refused this, and it's still in litigation. Uh, it's not entirely clear what is happening there. Um, now, there are two ways in which we want to achieve this. Uh, as I said, we want to require uh, sufficient intellectual property rights to be retained and in accordance with OA obligations. This can be done in two ways, either via prior license, and prior license is basically uh, that the CC BY license on all the publications of the grant has been signed into the grant. So uh, an author agreeing to that contract also agrees that a CC BY license is applied to all the future manuscripts. Uh, uh, and all the future AEMs that come out of that uh, grant. Uh, that's the prior license uh, method. And the second way of achieving this for some of our uh, uh, coalition as uh, organizations, especially, for instance, Arise in Europe, is to make sure that beneficiaries themselves ensure that the CC BY license is applied to the AEM or the VOR. So there the obligation is, as it were, on the uh, authors themselves. In, in fact, in both cases, the obligation is on the author because the author still has to in, include in their submissions to the publisher the uh, statement uh, that they will apply a CC BY license to their publications. So what's in it, this for authors? Well, uh, 
ownership and visibility, I would say. Don't give away to uh, publishers what, you're, uh, what you rightfully own as an, as an author, because if you own the AEM, you can reuse it and you can share it. Um, and there are, no there are no restrictions imposed by the publisher. As you know, um, if you have a graph or an illustration or a table in your paper, for instance, uh, until now you had to ask the uh, publisher for permission to reuse that in future publications. With the rights retention strategy and the application of the CC BY, that is no longer necessary. You can reuse everything that is in the AAM as you see fit. Uh, of course, we know that AAM, that open access AAMs and open access publication in general are more visible and therefore more citable. So it's in the interest of researchers to, to use the RS. And of course, as I said before, publisher can own and receive payment for the version of, of record. We don't see problem there. We believe that, of course, publishers provide the means to organize peer review, but this is very often carried out for free and it's part of the scholarly discourse. Uh, it is paid for by the subscription in subscription journals and by the APC in gold open access journals. Um, we have uh, three equally valid routes to OA, as you know, gold open access, rights retention strategy and transformative arrangements. Uh, some of the Coalition S funders have a preference for the open access VOR if prices are uh, fair and reasonable and make contributions to transformative agreements and journals. And for these funders, the rights retention strategy is a fallback strategy. But for others, for other uh, uh, funders, this is not the case. This is simply the default case. Uh, pub publication should always be deposited in a repository, as is the case for our eyes in Europe, for instance. So there were two, three steps in the implementation. First, we updated the grant conditions. Then we informed the publishers. And the, we asked the coalition as grant holders to include details of the public license in their submissions and, and deposit a copy of the AM in a repository on publication. So basically what authors need to do is two simple steps actually. Include the following sentence in blue in their publication. Uh, and of course an, a non-coalition as funded author can just use the second phrase, the CC BY license is applied to the AM arising from the submission period. But those who, are, who receive grants from a, a, a funder of the coalition have to use the full, um, the, the full version. And then on publication, uh, uh, authors must make the AM open access in, in a repository. Um, authors should also contact their funder or library in case of uh, disagreement uh, or in case of obfuscation by the publisher. We have developed a journal checker tool that allows you to see as a researcher which uh, uh, journal, how your journals uh, comply. Um, so they, basically, this is a search engine that allows you to fill in your journal, the funder and the institution, and that gives you information about what to do, whether you should pay a gold APC, whether the journal is under a transformative ag agreement in your jurisdiction, paid for by the library, whether it's a transformative journal, or whether you have to apply the rights retention strategy. Um, and the first iteration of that uh, journal checker tool is available since November 2020. I think I may stop here because we only had 10 minutes, I believe. Yeah, um, quite a few stop here. So uh, I can talk about uh, the publisher Smoke and Mirrors perhaps in a, at a later stage. Thank you so much, Johan. Thank you and thanks for sticking to the time. Uh, that will give us ample time afterwards then to have questions coming from the, uh, the audience. Thank you. Uh, next. We're going from Plan S to Plan S being implemented in uh, in Horizon Europe. And of course, Horizon Europe in this case is much broader than that. So thank you very much, Alea, for joining us. Alea Lopez de San Roman is a policy officer at the European Commission uh, in DG Research Innovation in the unit, as I said, working on open science. So Alea works on the, uh, um, you know, she has contributed and is contributing to the development and the implementation of the EU policy on open access to scientific publications, but also to research data. And before joining the European Commission, Alia was not a stranger to universities because she worked at the League of European Research Universities, LERU. So Alia, the, the floor is yours and you've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna share my screen now. So let me introduce you to Open Science in Horizon Europe. 
Uh, we know that there are many definitions, of course, of open science, but according to the Horizon Europe regulation and the Model Grant Agreement, open science means an approach to the scientific process based on open cooperative work, tools and diffusing knowledge. And it's also important to highlight how the Horizon Europe regulation sets how the concepts of open science, open innovation, open to the world should ensure excellence and impact of the union's investment in research and innovation while safeguarding the union's interests. So not only impact, but also excellence, the excellence of research and innovation. Open science in Horizon Europe uh, is the result of an evolution. Starting from uh, open access to publications in FP7, the evolution with a pilot on open access to research data and data management plans, and they're having open re uh, research data by default and open access to publications mandatory still in Horizon 2020. Now we are moving to open science. So beyond open access, open science more broadly being embedded across Horizon Europe. And when I mean uh, embedded, when I say embedded, I, I mean that it's across uh, the program from the evaluation of proposals in the grant agreement through the obligations, the requirements for our beneficiaries, also some additional obligations that might come via the call conditions, the work programs, the guidelines that we um, have, we offer to our beneficiaries to comply with those and the reporting during the project's lifetime. There has been a strengthening of the open access obligations that were from the beginning at the very core of the open science, now open science policy. And with regard to research data, a move from the focus on open access to research data to the broader concept of responsible research data in, man in management in line with the fair principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability. So with regard to the evaluation of proposals, uh, this is a key aspect of Horizon Europe and open science. Open science practices are now evaluated under the excellence criterion, under methodology and under quality and efficiency of implementation criterion with the capacity of participants and consortium as a whole and the list of achievements. I don't have the time to elaborate on those, but I would like to highlight that publications are expected to be open access. So in the list of achievements, those prior previous publications are already expected to be open access at the proposal level. Data sets are expected to be fair and as open as possible, as close as necessary. And the significance of publications to be evaluated on the basis of proposers' qualitative assessment and not per the journal impact factor. This is, I would say, a big step forward with our role as a funder and the change in the research assessment system in order to promote open science and to take into account open science practices in the evaluation of the proposals and the projects that we then fund. So there are a set of mandatory open science practices and I will briefly present those per the grant agreement and then some per the work program and call conditions and some recommended open science practices which are recommended, all those that are not mandatory. What you can see now in the screen is, of course, a non-exhaustive list. It's a list that is included in the template for proposals, but it's non-exclusive. And it includes early and open sharing of research, research output management, measures to ensure reproducibility of research outputs, open access to research outputs through the position in trusted repositories, participation in open peer review, and involving all relevant knowledge actors. So with regard to the obligations that our beneficiaries have per the grant agreement, as said in the model grant agreement, beneficiaries must ensure open access to peer-reviewed scientific publications relating to the results. In particular, they must ensure at the latest upon, the uh, upon publication, the position of the author accepted manuscript after the peer review or the version of record in a trusted repository and immediate open access via the repository under a Creative Commons Attribution License, CC BY or equivalent, and we allow CC BY non-commercial and non-derivatives so or the combination of the two for long text formats such as books and monographs. What is very important here is that no matter the publication venue, even if our beneficiaries decide to publish in an open access venue, the position in a repository and open access via the repository is required. The concept of trusted repository is new in Horizon Europe, 
we will provide further guidance and resources on trusted repositories in the program guide and in the annotated model grant agreement. Trusted repositories can be certified or those meeting certain requirements. And immediate open access under the uh, mentioned licenses. Here for us, the AAM, the author accepted manuscript or the version of record are at the same level. Our beneficiaries can decide to comply with their obligations via the AAM or the version of, of record. It is also a requirement to ensure information via the repository about any research output, tool or instrument, which is needed to validate the conclusions of the scientific publication. And we also have some requirements with regard to metadata which must be open under a Creative Commons public domain dedication or equivalent in line with the FAIR principles and provide information, amongst others, about the licensing terms and persistent identifiers. Beneficiaries or authors per the Horizon Europe regulation and per the Horizon Europe Model Grant Agreement must retain sufficient intellectual property rights to comply with the open access re requirements. They have to ensure the obligations that I just presented and retain sufficient IPR to ensure compliance with this. And they can publish in the venue of their choice, but publication fees are reimbursable only if publishing venue is full open access. Full open access, we understand that this is a venue in which all content is openly accessible to all. So publications in hybrid venues are not reimbursed uh, hybrid venues are those in which some content is openly accessible to all and some content is only accessible to subscribers, for example. But uh, let me emphasize that our beneficiaries can publish in the venue of their choice. With regard to hybrid uh, venues, it's a, a question of uh, reimbursability, non-reimbursability of the publication fees in those specific venues. So as you can see, our provisions uh, and requirements with regard to open science to scientific publications are very much aligned with a uh, plan S. Horizon Europe beneficiaries will have to comply with our requirements and those requirements are aligned with plan S. With regard to research data management, I will not elaborate uh, in depth, just to point out what I mentioned before. So the evolution towards the broader concept of a uh, research data management and responsible, responsible uh, research data management in line with the third principles. Now it becomes mandatory to set and regularly update a DMP, a data management plan. Open access to research data is still um, uh, abides by the principle as open as possible, as close as necessary, allowing for exceptions to the openness of research data, such as data protection, confidentiality, legitimate interest of the beneficiaries, a set of exceptions that we have in the Horizon Europe regulation, and we require the position and open access via the repository following the principle as open as possible, as close as necessary. And again, the same requirement as we had for publications, information is required via the repository about any tool, instrument, research output that is needed to reuse or validate the data. Metadata must be open and in line with the FAIR principles, but here, and it's a difference with regard to the metadata of publications, here we allow for exceptions according to the legitimate interest or constraints of the beneficiaries. We have a set of additional open science practices also via the model grant agreement, additional open science obligations that can come via the work program, additional obligations regarding the validation of scientific publications and additional open science obligations in case of a public emergency. So our action with regard to Horizon Europe is our role as a funder, but as you know, the European Commission plays many different roles, also in the policy making level, and open science is also an important part of the era communication, a new era for research and innovation. And here I would like to highlight two aspects, and just to focus on these two, because they are very much linked to the discussion we're having this afternoon and is the platform of peer review open access publishing and the analysis of authors' rights. So with regard to Open Research Europe, just to mention that this is a publishing platform, the European Commission's publishing platform at the disposal of our beneficiaries. It is not a repository, it's for original articles for all scientific areas of Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe and to provide immediate open access with content license for reuse. 
open peer review, transparent peer review, and each article has a dedicated metrics uh, page. No impact factor for ORE, for the Open Research Europe publishing platform. We don't want an impact factor. We want article level metrics and research to be evaluated and to take, be taken into consideration per its intrinsic merit and not per the venue of publication. Main assets of ORE for our beneficiaries, high quality, reliable and efficient publishing venue for EU research, no cost to authors beneficiaries. They can also publish their post grant. It's fully aligned, of course, with our requirements, and it's absolutely not an obligation to use. And you're, I mean, I'm gonna ask, have to ask you to, to uh, finish very soon. Just to conclude, copyright is also a key area of action for us. Uh, just to say that copyright is traditionally associated with protection, but it's also important for dissemination. And just to point out our actions in the era of communication, copyright directive, and the database directive, which is currently going to be reviewed very soon, and encourage you to provide your input. That's it. Thank you very much, Alea. And uh, before we go to our two next uh, panelists, actually, what we want to do, and I'd like to insist, I see that questions are starting to arrive. So this is really for, for you uh, members to ask as many questions as you want. So we've got questions coming. So please don't hesitate to start asking them uh, already in the Q&A. My colleague Vastian is actually tracking that and we'll make sure that we'll ask. Uh, for now, I just would like to go uh, and to move to the, the EUA, the new EUA um, uh, University Open Access uh, Checklist. So back in two, uh, 2015, uh, as a reminder, EUA published actually the Open Access Checklist. And this was really to serve as a general uh, guide uh, to key matters that should be considered when uh, institutions uh, plan to develop uh, an open access policy. Uh, and this was specifically for research publication. So it covered strategic, but also practical and economic aspects in the development of uh, an open access policy. Of course, the landscape uh, has changed quite dramatically uh, since then. And we felt, uh, uh, you know, that a new checklist was well due. Uh, so this was this is to provide a renewed su support to our members and universities uh, in general. So let me first insist, and I say this very strongly. You see it uh, written in red there. This is far from being a final document. Uh, it is a working document. That's why today's webinar is also important for us because we hope to get uh, a lot of your feedback. The document uh, will uh, then be revised and discussed with the EUA expert group in Science 2.0 and Open Science. And we plan to publish it uh, in the autumn. Uh, the new checklist uh, is currently organized, as you can see here on the slide, in three uh, uh, broad categories. Uh, the first one is in power. So this is about high level policy uh, strategy. The next one, as you can see in the middle, is uh, build capacity. So this is about libraries and consortium. And the last one is about reinforce uh, existing uh, structures. So we're talking about academic community um, uh, infrastructures uh, in this case, of course. So what we have also for those three categories is that for each, we have an approach. Uh, you see that with the, uh, uh, the, the, the target there, but we also provide uh, the checklist with a rationale that is you know, really underlying why, why uh, this uh, approach is there. Uh, we also bring in the strength and opportunities and looking towards the future, the things actually to uh, be careful about, the things to watch. Uh, you can see here on the first one for Empower, uh, there are uh, four different approaches. The first one is to add open access requirements to career uh, assessment policies a line of work force at EUA. The second is to adopt a policy that includes a rights retention statement, as was uh, talked about, about uh, for, uh, by uh, Johan. But it's also the third element, assigned funding for article processing fees. So uh, centralized and streamlined APC reporting. And finally, the fourth one is advocate policy change by governments and funders. The second category, the build capacities, with, uh, that's for libraries and consortium. Here are the approaches, three elements. First one, enter into a transformative agreement with the large publisher. Second, enter 
uh, into a transformative agreement with smaller or um, society publisher. And the third one is to enter into a publishing agreement with a pure open access publisher. And the third and final category is here to reinforce existing structure. And as I was say, saying, academic community-driven infrastructure. Three approaches here. First, support non-commercial scholar-led publishing initiatives, time and away. Support, support non-commercial infrastructure for scholarly communication. And finally, develop and use an institution or shared open access repository. And again, uh, we're keen to get your feedback, so fee please feel free to uh, to put that in. Also, we're going to have questions later. Just to be clear, uh, you'll have those resources uh, available uh, in the recording, uh, but these really are the resources on which we uh, based uh, the uh, checklist. So now what I'd like to do is we'd like to have a little poll to be able uh, to actually first understand who you are, who's attending uh, today's webinar, but then also to get your feedback, actually. So I'd like to ask you to go to menti.com. So you just type in your browser menti.com. It will ask you for a code. Uh, just type in 6354-1026. That's 6354-1026. And you're going to see the uh, poll appearing there. In just a second, it's coming. So I remind you, the code is 6354-1026, 6354-1026, and uh, should be appearing very soon. The very first question that we're putting to you, there you go. So you have already seen probably that on your website. So we'd like to know what your role is actually, who you are. Are you a university leader? Are you a director? Uh, or head of research support? Are you actually directors or heads of libraries? Are we talking uh, here to research support staff, library support staff, or researcher scholars? Okay, it's spread out, but obviously library support staff and research support staff are the majority, but it's good to know we've got also other representative here. I'll, I'm gonna wait a little longer because I know that they are more than 27 Participants, yes, please, good. And I see this is stabilizing now. So I think we're gonna be able to move to the next one. Thank you very much. So a lot of library support staff and research support staff. So our first question after asking you who you are is, is there a need for a new open access checklist for universities? So three, four already saying yes, uh, go ahead. So far. Strong support, someone doesn't know. Good, so so far it's good. Seems that people are appreciating that. Okay, excellent. So obviously a few people are not sure, but overall the vast majority think that yes, indeed there is a need for a new open access checklist for universities, wonderful. Thanks for your support. And the next question is, what do I like, we'd like to have from you is general feedback. So really what is needed, what is missing, what is okay in this checklist? So uh, we'll leave the question open for now because of course we couldn't go in the full details. We didn't have the time. Uh, but of course uh, we would like to get your input. So we'll leave this question open anyway. So you're welcome to put in um, you know, all the information you want in there. And please, otherwise, feel free to, to be in touch with us if you have uh, specific input uh, and feedback for us. Wonderful, thank you. So now that we've done those polls, let's go back then to our wonderful panel. Uh, it is now time for me to hand over to uh, Hardy Schwann. Hardy serves as an uh, open uh, scholarship librarian at the library at the, uh, of the National University of Ireland, Galway, uh, and this is since 2019. In his position, Hardy aims to push uh, the open science and open scholarship agenda at NUI Galway, and to build an open scholarship community at the university and beyond. In his previous position, Hardy worked at the Lancaster University Library in the UK as a research and scholarly communication manager. So Hardy, thank you so much for being with us today. 
and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. So, um, hi everyone. Um, I will talk to you briefly on some practical issues that we have encountered dealing with Plan S at the National University Island Galway. But first of uh, those of you who might not know, Galway is in the very west of Ireland. And NUI Galway, my institution, is a mid-sized uh, research intense institution that has an output of about two and a half thousand publications per year. And as Stefan mentioned in the introduction, the Irish National Fund of Science Foundation Ireland is a Coalition S member and has updated uh, policies aligned with Plan S. Now we benefit from a number of transformative agreements negotiated by uh, the National Consortium, IRL, but that is a fairly recent development. Um, apart from a deal with Elsevier that we had in Ireland from the beginning of 2020, all the other agreements, which includes, uh, include most big publishers, um, they have gone uh, live this spring, um, so very re uh, recently. Ireland is now in the rankings of transformative agreements in the top 10 countries worldwide, and 70% of journals where Irish authors publish are now covered by transformative agreements. So what have we learned from this experience so far that you should take notice of? Um, I have three points I want to make. So point one is resources needed to deal with transformative agreements. Um, it is important to be aware of that when, uh, whenever an author of your institution requests an APC being covered by an agreement, the library has to approve it. So in most cases, you do that through a dashboard that is provided by the publisher. So each of the bigger publishers um, have developed a dashboard, but they are all uh, slightly different. So what happens is that you will get an email notifications indicating that there is a new request to be approved. And then you need to check if the author is eligible. So in short, there is a workflow to be managed and often you need to communicate with authors and publishers as well. And I would guess that managing our transformative agreements takes about a day, maybe a day and a half of someone's time <clears throat> per week. So this is on top of all the other commitments that your staff has. And, and the question is, have you planned for that? My second point is communication. <clears throat> so you researchers need to know that these agreements are in place <clears throat> and how they work. Now, how do they find out? Um, so we had about seven or eight significant new agreements, transformative agreements going live this spring, but all at slightly different times. So do you publicize each one or do you wait and announce a few in a joint communication? Now we send uh, four communications out this spring through different channels, but as you will know, it is very difficult to get the attention of busy researchers and you need to repeat your message. Another point to consider is that agreements differ from each other. So some exclude certain journals, some cover only hybrid journals, and most are capped to a maximum number of included free APCs. Now, how do you communicate these nuances? And you need to be ready for a lot of emails coming your way, which goes back to my previous point about resources. And my third and last point is infrastructure needed. So this follows on uh, uh, from what Johan said earlier about green open access, and that is, of course, a Plan S compliant way to achieve open access. And like many other libraries, we run an institutional repository. So, so far my colleagues running our repository would, when a publication is deposited, check publisher embargo, apply it to the deposit, and the system would automatically attach a CC BY and C license for all publications. So now we need to detect Plan S supported publications and put them into a new workflow where no embargo is added and a CC BY license is attached. Now that sounds trivial, but is in fact quite a significant tweak of workflow and repository infrastructure that needs to be implemented. Okay, so in short, these were my three top lessons uh, learned for anyone you know, supporting Plan S. So there are, beware of the resources that you need, plan your communication strategy, and check if your workflows and infrastructure are fit for Plan S. Over to you, Stefan. 
Thank you very much. So well in time and also a very nice connection to the uh, webinar last week on transformative agreement. But thanks, thanks a lot, Hardy. And uh, there will be questions for you also. I can see right now that some some questions being put by the audience are already being answered by by Johan and, and others. So that's good too. Um, so uh, let's move on to the last of our panelists. Last but not least, of course, we've got uh, Mocha Kotar. Uh, she is from the University of Ljubljana. She participated in establishing the national open access infrastructure and was a member of the working group that prepared the draft national open access strategy and action plan 2015-2020. She acts as the open air national open access desk and manages the repository of the University of Ljubljana. Uh, regarding journal, she uh, participates in negotiations with the publishers and facilitates public procurement of the long tail of subscription journal. So, Moja, thank you so much for being with us, and the floor now is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you, DUA, for the invitation. Uh, I would like to assess uh, the readiness of the University of Ljubljana for Plan S, according to different aspects, from legal to agreements and skills. Uh, and the national context in Slovenia is similar to the situation at the University of Ljubljana, which is the biggest higher education and research institution in the country. So regarding a legal framework at the university, uh, we already have a mention of open science in the statutes of the university, uh, in the article on uh, autonomy of the university, but um, it would be good if the statutes also have uh, the provision on the rights retention. And even best would be uh, if the European Union copyright framework is amended with a regulation on rights retention for scholarly publications, because such a regulation is directly applicable and valid in the EU member state. Regarding uh, infrastructure, we have a repository which is open air compliant and fulfills the majority of plan S criteria for repositories. Uh, now, regarding Plan S compliant publication venues for the researchers from our university, of course, uh, all open access uh, platforms like Open Research Europe, uh, then um, the uh, University of Ljubljana Press. Uh, there are like 45 journals published at the university, and they're all uh, diamond open access journals. Uh, so far, we have no agreements for subscribe to open or with big uh, open access publishers or smaller independent publishers. Here, uh, VAT will, will be an obstacle uh, because uh, VAT rate 22% uh, will apply to such uh, open access agreements in comparison with 5% for subscription agreements. Uh, also, we do not support so far currently uh, open access infrastructures like the OAJ or SCOS. Uh, nationally, we have uh, 12 big deal agreements uh, with the uh, biggest legacy publishers. Uh, six of these agreements are transformative agreements, but still the majority of articles will have to ensure open access via the rights retention because uh, we have no transformative agreements with the biggest publishers. Uh, regarding long tail of subscription journals, we have an active uh, public procurement contract for subscriptions to individual journals. Uh, where we have also asked for free open access publishing in these individual journals. Uh, regarding skills and awareness, awareness of researchers for Plan S compliant open access, uh, well, this is still quite low in general with exceptions. Um, the majority of researchers are familiar only with uh, hybrid open access and uh, these terms like rights retention with applying prior license for a Plan S funder and complying with prior obligation in Horizon Europe will be demanding legal terminology for researchers. Uh, maybe they will not be proficient to negotiate rights retention with publishers for each individual article. So an EU regulation on the rights retention is needed or at least provisions in the statutes of the university. In total, I would say that uh, the University of Ljubljana is partially ready for Plan S but anything that can be done at the EU level will ease implementation of Plan S at universities. Um, further on, uh, if a university is not proactive in this moment in aligning with Plan S principles, its researchers will be disadvantaged compared to researchers from more active universities, 
And finally, I think that is, uh, it is of a paramount importance uh, that the, universe, the European University Association and Science Europe perceive subscriptions as outdated and unfit for the digital age and are supporting transformation of scholarly communication to open. And that will be all. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much and well in time, which is great because it's going to allow us to ask a lot of questions. But I heard you, uh, you know, you said the universities that would not be ready uh, for Plan S would be a disadvantage. Quite interesting. So I was going to ask you anyway and Hardy too, uh, what's your reaction to that open access checklist from the EUA? Uh, do you think this is worth it? Uh, is it along the line of what you think is needed? I, I think both your universities are quite well prepared. But is it that, you know, uh, you think this is needed for you or more broadly? And by the way, uh, Johan, Alea, you're welcome to come back uh, with your camera. You can join us. We're going to have loads of questions for, for you also coming from the audience. So Moicha, first, okay. uh, the checklist. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful for drafting the new version of the checklist. I think it's very useful, concise uh, to present to university management when you implement single actions, you need details anyway, and you check, you get the details elsewhere. And if a university implements what is listed there, it's well, okay, it's quite well prepared already. So very welcome. Okay, great. Hardy, what do you think? Yeah, I also think it can be useful. Um, I can see myself in uh, upcoming meetings with uh, senior management in the research office and beyond, kind of pulling that out and kind of showing it to them. Um, I find, well, is it a, I mean, this might be terminology, but I'm not sure it's actually a checklist. If I, you know, if people just look at uh, uh, the first slide, I don't know if, if they still have it in front of them, um, empower which is really useful. That might be the, the, the ones, the part I would use most, but the first approach that you mentioned is add open access requirements to career assessment policies. Now that in itself is a very big uh, chunk of work. Um, and it's not like this is like a, a recipe where you say, you know, first slice the onions and then add the garlic, you know, where step-by-step step, check, check. This is, these are big, big steps. And I think uh, we just need to use it in the sense that these, this is a, a good way forward, but there needs to be a lot of more granular steps in between. Well, okay, so yes. So instead of checklists, maybe we should talk about a strategy, an open access strategy for yeah. free universities. I get your point. Good, good to know. Uh, great, let's, let's, let's move on because we've got tons of questions actually coming from the, uh, uh, the audience. And I see that you, Johan, couldn't uh, take it. You had to answer many of those, so that's great. Wonderful, we can, we can do more stuff. But I still have one here from uh, Cal Brady, very specific. If an author does sign a publishing agreement that includes restrictive green open access terms, like you know, a 12-month embargo, does the RRS basically make those specific parts of the publishing agreement null and void? Um, it, it depends, actually. We, um, it depends what the status is of that, um, uh, of that contract. If that contract is a separate contract that is not a part of the copyright transfer agreement, then we advise the authors not, not, to, sign that, not to sign that contract. Because what we have noticed is that publishers are trying to get around the, um, uh, the rights retention strategy by uh, forcing authors to sign a separate contract that is not a copyright transfer agreement, but that is a contract that they will respect an embargo. And of course, a contract to respect an embargo is likely in contradiction with the rights retention strategy and with the grant agreement that the author has signed. Um, but it gets a bit complicated. Very likely, if this became before a judge, the author would be in the right. I mean, because we know, of course, that the publisher who is asking the author to sign that agreement, that, that contract, knew about the prior license and the prior obligation inherent in the grant agreement because we informed them last year. So they knew about it. So the, the legal standing of the of the publisher would be would not be very strong. Uh, but in any case, since it is a separate contract, you know, you could say contract against contract. We are confident, however, that publishers have no interest in uh, suing uh, individual authors. So, if, uh, so 
what we what we think is the case here that is that publishers are trying to scare uh, publi uh, scare authors by uh, saying that uh, by asking them to sign the, these 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 contracts. This is actually part of a of a number of tactics that we've seen, and we've uh, also seen, of course, that EUA and Cesar have signed a a, 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 a letter asking publishers to to cut out these practices to stop them uh, against the rights retention strategy. Um, uh, uh, interestingly, we have had no reply from the publishers uh, to uh, on that to that statement. As far as I know, you would have heard about it. Oh, you have. Um, Some have contacted us, so we'll have to speak very good. soon. <laughs> that's that's very interesting. We will have to speak indeed. But 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 clearly, we uh, we advise our uh, we we advise our researchers not to sign additional contracts. Uh, if it is not a co copyright transfer agreement, is no problem. That will be overridden by the CC BY because it's in the same level of, of, of law. But an additional contract is based on contract law, and it's not clear. In contract law, it's never clear which contract is um, yeah, it prevails over the other. Although we are confident that, in fact, this is just scare tactics. And I think, you know, authors should. Uh, be a little bit more confident in themselves and uh, just just do it. You know, what's the interest of a of, of a publisher suing their authors? I mean, not. I mean, all their all their nice talk about providing such great services goes out of the window if they do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, let me continue with you, but really opening up to others because there are some very practical questions, and still, and that's why I want to follow up uh, uh, from uh, Thomas Borg here on still the uh, RSS, they're asking beyond publication, he's asking, uh, can it be used for research data? And he's even asking actually EUA, uh, does the EUA consider research data as the intellectual property of the data uh, creators? Here I'd say, and I'm not an expert, so I'm, I'm quite keen to hear you guys on this, but that uh, the intellectual property rights uh, of all kinds of uh, research outputs, including data, are actually safeguarded uh, with the use of CCBY licenses, even data sets, uh, that, uh, and even the ones that are shared openly uh, and fairly, actually. Is, is that correct? Uh, and does the RSS, uh, can it be used for research data? Johan, but also all the others, feel free to... I think, I think Alina should answer that. She's probably better qualified than I am to, 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 to answer that. So, thank you for that question. With regard to research data, I would say there are different re uh, regimes, let's say. So raw research data, is not subject to copyright. So those are facts and there is no copyright rot uh, protection on raw research data. Then there can be on research data uh, meeting certain requirements to be covered by copyright. And this is why, for example, in the model grant agreement, we have this public domain dedication. So the public domain dedication and the creative commons, um, attribution and license are based on the existence of copyrights but then uh, putting those and waiving the rights and putting them in the public domain. And also in the case of the EU, and I mentioned that in one of the slides, the review of the database uh, legislation that we have, because also databases can be subject to both copyright and the sui generis database right that we have that is a specific of EU legislation. So I would say it's a complex uh, system, no copyright at all, copyright or sui generis database right. Okay. Very briefly, very copyright yeah. in two minutes is hard to... <laughs> I don't know, Moita or Hardy, if you wanted to add anything on that one. No? Okay. But let's stay, let's stay maybe with you then, uh, Alia, because there's quite a few questions also there for you. But from Inga uh, van Neuerberg from our uh, actually uh, expert group, uh, can you elaborate on the evaluation of open science at the proposal stage and during the project? Uh, and the other question she has more specifically, uh, have the annotated Muller Grant Agreement been uh, released yet? So specifically, is it out already? And then more on the evaluation of open science. How are you going to do that when you evaluate those proposals? Yeah, so hi, Inge. Um, the annotated Model Grant Agreement, I have to admit that when I saw your question, I quickly checked our website because I'm expecting it to be available anytime soon, not meaning today, because you know, sometimes we expect things to be published anytime soon and then it takes a little bit of delay. But I would say the annotated model grant agreement will be published uh, very soon, but I just checked and it's not published yet. With regard to the evaluation of open science at the proposal stage, yes, yeah, so they will be evaluated 
for the mandatory open science practices, which I presented during the presentation, open access to publications, research data management, and additional open science obligations, and the recommended also non-exhaustive list, all those will be taken into account in the evaluation of proposals under excellence, methodology, and quality and efficiency of implementation. It's also important to say that open science practices, if they are duly justified as not being appropriate for the project, duly justified, the score will not be lower in those proposals. And also, I have to mention that the ERC does not include open science in the evaluation of proposals, and the EIC, some uh, parts of it include this evaluation under impact and not under excellence. For more information about how we are going to evaluate and more guidance for proposers, the program guide, which also will be published hopefully very soon, and which is um, a program guide with guidance and resources with a focus on proposers. So at that stage, at the proposal preparation. Thanks. And unfortunately for you, you mentioned the ERC, so I cannot help it. <laughs> the Scientific Council uh, of the ERC actually decided to withdraw as a supporter of Coalition S uh, and announced in July 2020 that they would, you know, follow a path towards open access implementation that's independent from coalition S activity. So, do you, Alea, or you, Johan, and yes, I will come to you, Moita, and Hardy after, but I really wanted to ask that one. Do you have any reaction to that? And uh, have you been in touch with the Scientific Council of the ERC to discuss this? Well, on our side, uh, we took note of that decision on the part of the ERC Scientific Council. Uh, we, the European Commission, will continue to be involved uh, in Coalition S. We are actively participating in the governing bodies. For example, we have our Director General, Jean-Henri Paquet, in the Leaders Group, and my Head of Unit, Costas, in the Executive Steering Group. I'm part of the expert, many colleagues in the task forces. So we are actively involved in Coalition S. And our policy, our requirements on open access are also applicable for ERC beneficiaries. So this is what I can say. We took note of the decision. We are still involved in Coalition S and our policy also applies to them with the exception, let's say, of the evaluation of proposals. Yes, I, I, I'd like to add to that that I did seek to talk to the ERC about this and, and, and it became clear that we did have a number of that this was due to actually a renewal of the of the ERC board, and there were new people coming in who were who had different views on uh, how to achieve open access. And um, uh, basically, it came down that we agreed to disagree on the on, on the way forward. But it's very important to note, as Alea said, that uh, all ERC grants will be fully subject to uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, uh, the MGA of, of Horizon Europe, and thus fully sub subject to to Plan S requirements. So the, 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 the statement, I think, or the, the, the withdrawal is uh, more symbolic than it is than it has consequences in, in, in reality for uh, uh, ERC grant holders. ERC grant holders will be fully subject to the MGA and uh, uh, coalition as provisions and plan as provisions inherent in that. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your answers. Uh, Moicha, we're talking politics here. Uh, and we know that the uh, Slovenian presidency is coming for the uh, the EU. So, uh, you know, a high level question, but is there any advantage to take out of this for open access specifically? Uh, do you know if they're, 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 they have anything uh, planned, they have anything planned around open access and open science? Yes, thank you. Since you announced this question in advance, I found the ministry. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> um, yeah, they told me Thanks that uh, it will not be uh, specifically open access, but it will be uh, like new council conclusions on uh, era governance. Uh, and since this will be like drafting, uh, Slovenia will be um, coordinating drafting of these new conclusions. Uh, and since this will be built on the Air Council conclusions that were adopted during the German presidency, it is very likely that uh, open science will be included and in changing the research assessment. But the topics uh, will still be decided, uh, I was told, by uh, member states, EU mem the EU member states. So there's no precise um, sketch yet available or knowledge. Thank you. And, and Hardy and, and Moita, I mean, I want to know, so we talked about the retention rights statement, and it all seems very easy to do. As you said, Hardy, you know, it's a checklist, but it's not really a checklist. So is it that easy, actually? 
So the way, you know, Johan, you know, puts it, and I seem to agree with him, it seems so simple, you know, to, to do it. So is it that easy? And where do you see challenges if there are any? Hardly uh, first, maybe. Well, unfortunately, I have to say it's not that easy, I think. Um, well, if you have Johan explaining it to you in, in slow uh, steps and with the confidence he has, it, it sounds pretty easy. Um, but I, from my own experience, so I do uh, training events on uh, open access and I had a recent one in trans for transformative agreements. And there is, uh, I think that it's very new and the concept of uh, basically the, um, the rights retention strategy trumping anything that the publisher does afterwards I think that's the step that is new and that's the step that people only are starting to get their heads round. Yeah. It's also, I hope that's correct, Johan. Um, that is correct, but you, you should feel free to, to invite me, Hardy. I'll be glad <laughs> I will to invite you. you. Um, the, the second thing Thank is you. that um, because um, transformative agreements, as I mentioned before, in Ireland, there have been a lot in a small period of time pretty much all we're talking about is transformative agreements at the moment, how they work, et cetera. And as I mentioned before, 70% of journals are now covered in Ireland, which is very good. And that's the good news story. And I think then coming in with the rights retention as a kind of a fallback plan is not quite the good news story that the transformative agreements are. So it's a little bit more difficult on that communication side to present both in one, um, so yeah, that would be my my take on it. Thank you, Moisa. Uh, yeah, thank you. If I take a bit wider perspective, so uh, we need to ensure conditions for researchers to comply with Plan S. It can be either transformative uh, agreement uh, or rights retention strategy. So if we don't have a transformative agreement with a certain publisher, then it's the rights retention strategy. Okay, uh, I would say that technically this is not difficult. Uh, the researcher adds a certain text to the manuscript and sends everything to the publisher. But it seems to me that uh, researchers fear rejection of publishers, uh, which um, are perceived at, as, at, as bringing value in their career advancement. Mm -hmm. This, I think that this is the major fear. It's not technically difficult. I think that even we don't need a special copyright help desk here at the university, if I can understand this, <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. researchers that are really very smart people. And it's not even uh, time consuming. The only thing is that if you really want to publish somewhere uh, and the publisher says, no, no, or yeah, is um, like uh, doing things that Johan is telling us about, the smoke and so on things. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it's just, in, uh, for now, it's just intimidation. It's not, I mean, they are not rejecting the papers at the outset and that's what they have to do. No, I mean, there is actually a question from Linda Jonsson on this can, and he, she yeah. says exactly, can you please tell us about the publisher Smoke and Mirrors that it was not time for earlier. Okay. So can you tell us more about that? Since yeah, shall I share my screen again? Do I have a few minutes? Uh, yeah, why not? Okay. Let me share my screen again. Now. Oh, so that was yeah, yeah. Those were the, uh, the, the slides. Yeah, I had, the, I had those slides anyway. So let me let me see yeah, if yeah. I. Do I that. think that's very practical, so it would be interesting indeed. Go ahead. And while you do that, there's a comment here also uh, from someone saying that readers not always realize they may be paying for something that could uh, be uh, free, actually. Some search yeah. services uh, have prevalent positions on the internet. Just a comment yeah. from one of the, uh, from the audience. Go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, so um, what you will typically see from, from publishers is statements like this. This journal does not allow AAMs to be made open access under the RS. If you use RS wording, we will ask you to sign a contract pledging you will respect our embargo. Or choosing the green route means the work is under an embargo that is not compatible with our, your funder's policy. But in fact, th this is all nonsense, actually. It's meant to confuse. Uh, the prior li it's very simple. The prior license under the right rights retention strategy takes precedence over any conflicting uh, provisions in this funding agreement. And by, by, by saying to the publisher that you apply an, uh, a CC BY to the, to the AAM arising from the submission, you give 
as an author, an author gives appropriate notice. But if, of course, an author is then going to sign to an embargo uh, uh, period in a different contract, then the researcher may be in breach of their grant conditions. So that's why we advise not to do that. Um, uh, the only choice, I mean, and I repeat this, the only choice that a publisher has at the beginning of the process, the submission process, is to reject the article. That right they have. Once they put the article through the submission process uh, and, and through review, they have taken notice and you have given them notice as a researcher of the rights retention strategy and they have to respect that. So there is not much they can do there. Um, then they say, so publishers will say, you cannot use the rights retention strategy when submitting to this journal. Well, of course you can. I mean, they have no jurisdiction to, to prevent you from doing that. The, option, the only option is to refuse the paper, as I said. And then some, some of them will make it even more convoluted and say, you must pay an APC to be compliant with your funder. Uh, even when they know that, uh, even if the funder will not reimburse it, for instance, in a hybrid journal. So uh, this is important to, to stress again, an APC payment is never a condition for compliance. Uh, where applicable, the funder will pay for APCs, uh, but that is something that the journal checker tool will tell you. And where it is not the case, where you don't have the money uh, or, or the funder doesn't have the money, then uh, the rights retention strategy suffices. The rights retention strategy really can be used as a fallback strategy. So um, click here to pay for an APC for publication. Well, don't do that because then basically, of course, the publisher is then asking you to, to uh, enter into a contractual agreement where you pay and then the payment is on you. Uh, uh, this is actually very devious on behalf of the publishers because they know full well that the funder will not pay and nevertheless they are putting pressure on the author to 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 pay so again this is something where uh, this is a case where you better submit to a different uh, journal um then and then there are a couple of other arguments uh, that repositories are not up to the task or that this will end uh, academic publishing as we know it but th that's the kind of rhetoric that i uh, that i will Spare you uh, uh, if you don't mind. Okay. Great, thanks but a lot. Those the, so, so those are the tricks that we that that we have seen and that I wanted to that I wanted to talk about the smoke and mirrors. But yeah. let's not get intimidated. Is my is my answer there? I mean the the rights retention strategy is is sufficient. I agree with Hardy that it that it does create. Uh, a, a lot of problems downstream eh, for the repository managers, for instance, and 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 all of that. But in fact, we should be happy because there's also a result. The result is that all of those articles become available open access. I mean, so okay, it's more work, but we get something in return. I mean, as I always say, it's you know, one article at a time. <laughs> You know, one article at a time, one researcher at a time who is convinced that this is worth it and who has understood how it works. Of course, we are not used to thinking that we have rights as researchers, but we do. I mean, would you, for instance, hand over the key to your house to somebody who comes to your house and paints your house? B because basically, that's what's happening. That's what publishers do to your paper. They, they paint it, they make it nicer, they, uh, they, they, you know, they, they smoothen out the, 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 the cracks uh, through the, through the um, uh, review process. But then after the painter has painted your house, you're not handing over the keys, are you? I mean, and that's basically what we've become used to over the last 30 years, to hand over the keys. Yeah, and you could, I mean, and also, in this, excuse me? and also in this case, I think what's really nice is that you could hand over the keys to somebody else. And those are the libraries. Yes, it's taking, exactly. again, a very important role. So, I mean, again, Moitra, Hardy, I mean, do you see that happening? Or do you... How aware are the researchers? How much do they come to you? Do they actually realize and are they uh, coming to you? Is there awareness around Plan S, around retention rights, etc.? And you're seeing more questions being asked. Uh, if I may, um, the majority of researchers that are aware are researchers uh, that already had um, European Commission framework program uh, projects and they were already exploring, preparing um, to, 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 to organize another project, another consortium. Uh, and they also understand what this brings and they also understand the differences between policies in Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe. 
uh, they are uncertain still how they will comply. Uh, I think that rights retention could be uh, problematic for them in a sense that it would take more of their engagement. It's not difficult to understand, I think, but um, they are busy people and they don't really want to spend too much time on um, like uh, administrative burden, which might be there. That, that's how they perceive it. Uh, but generally, we don't really uh, receive many questions yet, though the national funder, the major funder of research in Slovenia is Planas funder, but still um, I think that no calls are published uh, as yet uh, with uh, such provisions, Planas provisions. Okay, thanks, Hardy. Good. Yeah, maybe just, oh, sorry, you on, you want to come in? No, no. Well, Hardy, one of the things that I say to research and also Moisa is, is that, and that they understand is when you reuse a table, a graph, uh, an illustration from, from your previous papers, now you have to ask for permission. And it's very annoying. It's extremely annoying. And you know that as a researcher, that it's annoying. Applying the rights retention strategy gives you the right to reuse that without asking anyone for permission. People f find this very difficult to get their, uh, to wrap their heads around. I mean, I am the editor of, uh, of Glossa, an open access journal, and I very often get questions from authors saying, could I please reuse my articles? All our articles are CC BY. And I will get these questions saying, could I please reuse my articles? So this is, of course, one of my favorite letters to write to authors saying, you don't have to ask me permission, you have all the permissions. Yeah. And then they are, oh, really? <laughs> they, they, they can't quite wrap their heads around this. I mean, and this is because it's new, of course, and they've never learned this in school or never had courses about this. They assume that the the default option is that that publishers have these rights yeah it will take it will take a few years but uh it the few years. is quite yeah. important hardy you were gonna say so, um yeah no i i get several emails a day regarding transformative agreements um you know questions from researchers but so far i've maybe had one or two on rights retention strategy so that that just shows that the awareness is is pretty low at the moment and transformative agreements are so new and a bit more exciting to be honest um and also one thing i would say is is like an unintended side effect from plan s and transformative agreements is that they are open to everyone I should say that, you know, from our research, it's about 30% of our papers are Plan S funded, 30%. That means 70% are not. But transformative agreements are open to all our researchers, including so uh, including early career researchers, PhD students who are not funded. So that is really a good news story for us. Yeah. And, and, and along those lines, among the options for the future, and I'm going back to Alea because you haven't spoken much, but you know, the Open Research Europe platform, uh, you mentioned that, of course, you had a slide on this. That's an option. But you also mentioned no impact factor. It's going to be article based. Do you have targets? Uh, do you have indicators? Uh, anything about the success you want to achieve? Are you thinking about that? Are you thinking about publicity? Uh, how, how will that be managed, actually? Yes, yeah, so, um, I would say is the uptake by the research community, the number of submissions, the number of publications, a steadily increase in the number of submissions of publications that would be a success factor, I would say, for the Open Research Europe platform because the need to build trust in this publishing venue is the main a key concern or key challenge for, for the upcoming period. I would just like to clarify because I saw a question from Kylie about the, um, the rights retention strategy and the commission. And, and I know it's not obvious, so I would like to clarify. So uh, we require immediate open access under open licenses and sufficient IPR retention. That is in line with the prior obligation approach of the rights retention strategy. But we will not follow the prior license in the sense that we will not have a CC BY automatically apply per the Horizon Europe grant agreement. And I think that is important. So the Horizon Europe requirements are aligned in that they follow the, uh, the approach, they are aligned to the prior obligation approach, but they will not uh, have our beneficiaries a CC BY automatically apply per the grant agreement. And also just uh, another <laughs> clarification, sorry, but here being a lawyer, um, with regard to Horizon Europe, so our beneficiaries are bound by those requirements, Horizon Europe. There is no legal obligation with regard to Plan S. There is no implementation or uh, application of Plan S by our beneficiaries. They have 
to apply to meet our requirements, the Horizon Europe requirements, which are aligned to planets. So it's <laughs> just a matter of specifying mm -hmm. that sometimes beneficiaries get confused. You have to meet our requirements. Those requirements are aligned to planets. <laughs> I'm glad we have at least one lawyer with us. <laughs> Good. Unfortunately, we're getting to the end. I just want to make sure uh, to the whole of the audience that some of the questions have been answered directly in the Q&A in the chat. Uh, so please go and check there because, of course, uh, we didn't take all the questions because some had already been uh, answered, as I mentioned, by, by Hope Johan. What I'd like to finish with is <coughs> I'd like to ask you, uh, you, Mocha, and, and Hardy, really, in order to be able to implement the, the, the changes, I'd like to ask you what is the one thing you would like to see happening and what is the one thing that you can commit to do uh, at your own level? So you'll have one minute to do that. And to you, Alea and, and Johan, uh, so Coalition S and the European Commission, of course, have been instrumental in pushing open access and really putting it... Uh, at another level. So there's a huge political momentum right now. But what will be your next move? What is the one thing you guys are planning to do? For example, now you told us about the uh, retention threats, Johan. So what's next? So uh, why don't we start with uh, with Morisa? OK, thank you. So the one thing uh, I would like is that uh, researchers would recognize that open science is just science done right. There are so many developments uh, in the European research area regarding fair research data management, the European uh, open science cloud. Uh, uh, then um, there are plans for um, increasing uh, high performance uh, computing capabilities, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, in such an environment, there is really no place anymore for closed um, scholarly communication. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and of course, bibliodiversity, uh, this needs to be cultivated. And uh, what I can do is really uh, raise awareness everywhere I appear. <laughs> that would be in short, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Hardy. What about you? Yeah, I think I can be quite brief. I think my learning from today was um, that the rights retention strategy so far for us in our communication has really been more of an afterthought. Like, you know, if if you're not covered by a transformative agreement, like here's a, a plan B, which is not quite as sexy as plan A. But I think what I learned, especially from uh, Johan's example with um, graphs and other material that you know, it's so easy to reuse. There is a really uh, a good uh, um, good news story here that I would like to push and uh, kind of complement our um, our messaging. So thank you for for that, and also thank you, Johan, for you know the uh, invitation to to get you on a on on a training session. Oh, that, that, mm -hmm. That's much appreciated. Thank you. I've said to Johan before. I mean, the spin is easy. But it's just a matter of multiplying it enough. Anyway. Yes, yes, exactly. You have to, you, you know, I, I also often feel like a missionary, you know, you know, repeating the. So, what the is your next mission for, for, for Coalition S? Yeah. So, should I. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, so so we will keep monitoring, of course, the rights retention strategy because I mean we will we want to hear from our researchers how the how the wording is received by the publishers because we want to be able to talk about that. What our next move is going to be is we are going to work on uh, the price transparency framework, as you know, as of July next year, the uh, pub uh, publishers who wish to receive money from the funders will have to provide a certain amount of price transparency. We are trying to. Uh, to uh, make that information available, probably not to everyone, but to a selected set of uh, a se a selected set of librarians. So that is something that we're looking into now. What the legal requirements are there, and another thing we would like to do is um, provide uh, more support for Diamond Open Access journals. We've just had the Diamond Open Access Journal uh, study, which was a very rich study showing how. A varied uh, open access uh, diamond journal area really is and uh, we would very much like to uh, I mean it represents nevertheless you know eight to nine percent of publications you know in in open access as, a, as opposed to uh, you know 10 to 11 percent of APC based open access publications so that's not negligible if we could 
developed this um, uh, Diamond Open Access Journal. This would be a way like ORE at the Commission for the academic community to take back ownership of academic publishing, as I personally think that uh, we, we should do. Okay. And in this, of course, we would be together with universities and other stakeholders to, to move that forward. Thank you, Johan. Alea, last words for you. Well, actually, I'll speak after you, but you're, you're next <laughs> meeting at the, at the European Commission. So I would say delivering on everything that we have put in place, uh, the Horizon Europe uh, Model Grant Agreement. It's a few pages on open science, but it's been the result of years of work, uh, immediate open access, open licenses, non funding of hybrids. So there is a lot of work in that. So now to implement, to monitor the European Open Science Cloud, citizen engagement, or the author's rights and copyright legislative framework, which is fit for research and innovation, this is scheme. So I would say and research assessment, of course, is very key for us. Delivering on all those topics is already a very high, challenging and very exciting uh, agenda for, for the future. Yes. It is indeed. And we'll work very closely with you on the research indeed. assessment also. Thank you. Almost on time. I'm one minute late. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, I just want to mention we'll leave the webinar open for an extra 15 minutes so that uh, that will be with the slide on open access checklist so that everybody then will be able to comment also on that. So that's one thing we'll do. But otherwise, many thanks to all of you, the panelists, uh, for having accepted our invitation and, and for really the good discussion today. It was lively. I loved it. It was not just, you know, one after the other. You intervene all the time. That was great. So we hope also this webinar, of course, and the whole webinar say it was, was useful to, uh, to the members and to the community at last. At last. Uh, at large. Remember, it's all going to be on uh, the EUA YouTube channel for the recordings. Uh, thanks also to the members of the program committee, the EUA expert group uh, Science 2.0 and Open Science, the group of negotiators and the steering committee of the Read and Publish uh, study. A special thanks, of course, to uh, my colleagues at the EUA Secretariat, in particular Vincien, Vincien Gaillard, who was the mastermind behind the whole webinar series, but also uh, Rita Moraes, uh, Aurélie Clenet, and our former colleague, uh, Leonard Story. So other EUA webinars uh, and events are coming. You can check those, of course, on our website. You have all the information there. Uh, the one I mentioned, of course, coming 8th of July, is the webinar that will be uh, providing the results from the EUA survey on open science. Uh, that will be uh, from principles, really, to, to practices. Then in September, we've got the EUA College for Doctoral Education annual meeting, and in November, the European Quality Assurance Swarm. Again, thank you to all of you. Thank you very much to the audience for, uh, for, for attending today. And I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll speak again very soon, uh, as this is not a, a story that is over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. All right.